Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 524, Juneteenth. This episode of Craft Lit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am overwhelmed (laughs) this week. I realized Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the one who came up with the stages of grief thing, back in the day. It was originally the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, which I learned from the movie All That Jazz. (laughs) Because, you know, all education comes from films. Ah, Heather. But it looks like uh, these have been amended now. And I think it's making more sense, actually. And there is actually a reason I'm bringing this up. So it looks like now there's the seven stages of grief. And I've seen it phrased differently, but I kind of like this one. Shock is the first one, which I think is really important. Then denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing. I liked the phrasing of that because much like rats in a maze, when we try to problem solve our way through something, often first in our head, but not always, Like a rat in a maze, you go down one route and see if this works. Well, no, that's not going to work out. So what about this one? No, no, that's not one. That's not going to work out either. Maybe this. And eventually, if you continue to try, you arrive at acceptance. Or there's another version of the Kubler-Ross change curve that ends in integration, where it's not so much acceptance like, oh, oh, well, I guess that's just how it's going to be. I think integration makes more sense because that's where you get a new normal. And both in the book this week and in life these days, I'm sensing a move towards integration. And that word can be kind of loaded, especially with some of the the conversations that are happening around the country in the States and elsewhere right now. Uh, But I don't mean it to be not political integration, but physical, emotional, how we see ourselves interacting in the world integration. And I think it's, it's kind of interesting. And it made me think a lot this week about post 9-11 at my school. If you've been listening for a long time, you know, the school that I taught at was a half block south of the South Tower. And so 9-11 was something that happened to us, not on the television. One of the things that we learned accidentally, I suppose, was that people heal from traumas in very, very different ways and in very, very different times, lengths of time. And I don't remember that being so clear to me before 9-11. And I definitely know it was not clear to the general public after 9-11 Because I, back when we were in Virginia, I was interviewed. I don't even know if I talked about this on the podcast. I was interviewed by a TV station for a a 10 years out 9-11 thing. It was right after we moved to Virginia. I think it must have been CNN, actually. I went on the website and watched both my interviews and the interviews of several other people who had been in, in the towers or in the Pentagon on September 11th in 2001, and made the mistake of reading the comments. It was very interesting because we all, all of us, got, I wouldn't say attacked, but certainly got snarked at by a majority of the people. So I thought this was interesting for two reasons. One, these people who clearly were over 9-11 themselves, mostly because they weren't anywhere near any of the sites and didn't know anyone in person in real life, anyone who had physically been in the space and in danger. 
these people had gone out of their way to watch video interviews about people who were finding a new way forward 10 years after. And whether they did that like to rub salt in their own wound or just because they wanted to feel better about themselves by proving to themselves that they were no longer affected by 9-11, I have no idea what their psychology was that pushed them towards watching this. But I do know that having watched people who were talking about struggles over time, not necessarily struggles that they were still having. I wasn't still flinching every time an airplane flew overhead, for the most part, unless they were really, really low <laughs> and really loud. But other people who were interviewed, especially people who were in the towers or running out of the towers, certainly and obviously had greater trauma to recover from than, than we did. They got snarked at too. Like, it's been 10 years, get over it. I don't know what your problem is. The I don't know what your problem is, that was the one that stuck with me. Because how easy is it these days to find out what the problem is? You can do the Google for just about anything. And if you're trying to figure out why someone is behaving the way they are, it's pretty easy to find at least something that's been written about just about any mental state you can come across. And as you know, on Craftlet, because the books are so much older than, than we are, <laughs> hey, there's something older than me, that's awesome, uh, because these books are so much older than our world's structure, sometimes people do things in these books that make little sense to us, but made perhaps perfectly good sense at the time. That's going to happen today in our book, but that's also some of what I've been watching happen out in the world. Our media people are not helping a whole lot right now, as far as I can tell, mostly because they haven't been reading classic fiction <laughs> and listening to the podcast and don't really necessarily have a grasp on why people sometimes behave in ways that, without knowing the context, make no sense to them. There's a lot of that going around right now, from what I can tell. And I feel like listening right now. I And the commentators, of course, are in tough situations right now because their job is talking. And I am seeing more and more people like Seth Meyers handing off a lot of the, the discussion about what's going on right now to one of his writers, Amber is it Rufflin, I think. She's marvelous and very funny, but also very young and perky and gorgeous and adorable. And I'm going to link out to a fake movie trailer that the two of them made, which is, is sort of kind of, but not really based on hidden figures and uh, the movie that came out several years back that was so good. Anyway, they, they made a fake movie trailer called White Savior. And if you aren't familiar with this trope, there's, and I'm using this term, I did not come up with this phrase. There are two different tropes that are unfortunately complementary. There's the magic Negro trope, which goes way back. And that's where you get something like Green Mile or... Oh, Will Smith did the uh, the Legend of Bagger Vance, so that's that's one trope. And then there's the White Savior trope. And if you aren't familiar with the White Savior trope, there is no better way to familiarize yourself with it in a way that will make you laugh at the same time that you cringe. And I think that is the perfect way to understand the trope. So I'm I'm linking out to that YouTube video, I really recommend you watch it. Because one of the things that becomes really clear is, and of course, I'm yammering on about it, the importance of listening cannot be stressed enough, and asking questions. And today is Juneteenth. And I was lucky enough to have students in my classrooms when I was teaching in New York who told me about Juneteenth. And I had thought it was the date that the Emancipation Proclamation was proclaimed. It's actually the date that a Union officer rode in to Texas to alert Texas to the fact that the Civil War was over. 
And the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed two years earlier. But June 19th, it was announced in Texas that slavery was done. And that's at least in part where Juneteenth became a celebration. Now, if your first reaction to Juneteenth is, but there is no such word as Juneteenth, there's a whole lot of writing on how language among slave populations and Caribbean populations, some, sometimes which were uh, overlapping, how language evolved from uh, West African languages into smashing up against French and then smashing up against English. And there is actually a grammar and a structure. And it may not be familiar to you, but if you listen more, you'll hear more of the structure. One of my professors at UCLA, who was in the movie The Color Purple, taught us, I'm trying to remember how she explained it, but I, I remember the grammar. It was something is done as in it's finished and I'm good and I can walk away. It's been done. I did it. You should have known I did it. <laughs> Get off my back. And it's done, done. It's done. It's over. It's finished. If you ever bring it up again, <laughs> we're going to have a problem. <laughs> and it it made sense. So I was lucky enough to have a lot of really good people to listen to when I was younger and and still fresh and not jaded. <laughs> but I do have a, a chunk of audio for you to listen to. And I bring it up because last night at the uh, Craftlet chat on Zoom, which of course you're all welcome to join in and uh Links are over at Facebook, or you can pick them up from the show notes at craftlit.com slash 524. Last night, Jennifer mentioned that she was reading a book by ta Coates. You may remember that in 2015, he wrote and released a book that was a, a letter to his son that he expanded a little bit and put into book form. And he reads the audiobook version. That is what I have a clip of audio from for you to listen to. Jennifer is actually reading a different book by Tiny C. Coates. It is called The Water Dancer. She highly recommends it. And it is read in audiobook form by Joe Morton. Joe Morton came up on the chat last night because he was in a John Sayles movie back in the 90s called The Brother from Another Planet. And if you've never seen a John Sayles movie before, he was an indie director. He's fairly raw. He did Madwan. He did. Uh, he did several hard movies. Brother from Another Planet isn't quite so hard, but it does deal head on with racism because Joe Morton is an alien who lands actually on Ellis Island, and this is the Ellis Island of the '90s. This is before it was cleaned up and turned into a museum for people to visit. And even if that's the only part of the movie that you watch, it's beautiful and it's haunting. And it could be all of 45 seconds long. I don't remember. What I remember is that I remember it. And I saw the movie 25 years ago. So it stuck with me. Anyhow, Joe Morton reads the fiction book by Tani C. Coates. And I am now going to play you a clip from Tani C. Coates' um, original first book that he published, which is called Between the World and Me. This was a letter to his 15-year-old son beyond the handiwork of men. But race is the child of racism, not the father, and the process of naming the people has never been a matter of genealogy and physiognomy so much as one of hierarchy. Difference in hue and hair is old, but the belief in the preeminence of hue and hair, the notion that these factors can correctly organize a society and that they signify deeper attributes which are indelible, this is the new idea at the heart of these new people who have been brought up hopelessly, tragically, deceitfully to believe that they are white. These new people are like us, a modern invention. But unlike us, their new name has no real meaning divorced from the machinery of criminal power. The new people were something else before they were white. Catholic, Corsican, Welsh, Mennonite, Jewish. And if all our national hopes have any fulfillment, then they will have to be something else again. Perhaps they will truly become American and create a nobler basis for their myths. I cannot call it. 
As for now, it must be said that the process of washing the disparate tribes white, the elevation of the belief in being white, was not achieved through wine tastings and ice cream socials, but rather through the pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land, through the flaying of backs, the chaining of limbs, the strangling of dissidents, the destruction of families, the rape of mothers, the sale of children, and various other acts meant first and foremost to deny you and me the right to secure and govern our own bodies. One of the things that stuck out at me about that clip is something that we have wrestled with over the years on Craftlit. I think most recently this happened in North and South. It may have also happened more recently than that. But North and South, I remember, I remember my surprise with Elizabeth Gaskell. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it seemed, uh, she had characters who were saying anti-Irish slash anti-Catholic things. And even though so much of her book was about solving societal problems, especially those that affected poor working class, a lot of things about women and their position in, in the society, in this newly industrialized society, even though she was so hip to all of that, she didn't recognize, I guess, her own prejudices against the Irish. I remember while teaching in New York that we would come across things like this every once in a while in books that we were reading or short stories that we were reading. And the kids were always flabbergasted because white was just white. And there were several things that were obvious and true about white folks to my students. One, everyone white is white. And two, everyone white is rich, which was always interesting to me as a high school teacher <laughs> who was definitely not rich and was never going to be rich. And when I, I would brought in my paycheck and we went through how much I made during the month and how much my expenses were and how there was no money left at the end of the month. And this was shocking to my students. And it was a surprise to me at the time. And in retrospect, it, it shouldn't have been. And I think ta Coates does a beautiful job of pointing out that this whiteness that is being used right now as a wedge, as a, a political weapon in many places all over the, the globe right now, that is a recent construct. And even though it feels like something that just is, it's a construct. And as ta Coates says, prior to white being the descriptive for an entire group of people, there's a lot more nuance. There were lots of reasons you could hate somebody. <laughs> uh, and all you have to do is look at the Lower East Side of New York City and how that's changed over time in its cultural, ethnic, and immigrant population where people were emigrating from. It's weird to think about it as something relatively new in the grand scheme of things, but it is. And then you go and see a movie like The Big Sick or the movie that I sure hope movie theaters open up in time for us to see in the Heights. And those are the, the moments when you get to have a, a chance to see inside somebody's world that isn't your own and find out, actually, people aren't that different, which sounds like such a trite thing to say, but I don't mean it in a uh, deep down inside, everybody just wants the same things for their kids. That may be true, but I think more than that, it's, and I've, I've mentioned this several times on, on our Craftlet Zoom chats, a lot of our friends in New York City, when Andrew and I lived there, were Jewish and Catholic marriages. On the outside, that may look, well, uh, certainly for a long time in history, that would have been a radical thing, period. But it also may look from the outside even now, like, wow, how does... How does that work? And does it work? And the answer is yes, because culturally, it's food, family, and guilt. Those are the three primary motivating forces in Jewish and Catholic families. And so, uh, and as well as strong mothers, by the way. So even though there are some fundamental differences between the two religions, culturally, you find out that really you're not all that different. 
the things that have motivated you to do and be who you are in life are not that different. Jewish families and black families often, certainly in the last 50 or 60 years, have done pretty well together. Strong mothers, justice, justice shalt thou pursue. There's a lot of social justice ground that the religious left and Jewish and black activists share. And listening to each other is always key. And I really hope one of these days I can convince one of my former students to do a book with me. That has been a dream for a while. And maybe I'll be able to bring back the premium feed on the app and pull it off that way. I'm not entirely sure. Life is, as we know, a bit up in the air and nobody knows what the future will hold. So those are my thoughts. I'm trying to do the best I can to listen, check in with my students, watch everyone I can, learn all that I can. And books like ta Coates' book, as well as the book that Toshi showed us last night called This Book is Anti-Racist. It's a young adult level book. It's got uh, pictures in it, beautiful art, but it also kind of introduces you gently to terminology and to understanding why for some of us, I'm sure it seems like all of a sudden this stuff erupted out of nowhere. And it really isn't out of nowhere. It's been growing. It's largely been quiet because mainstream media hasn't had to pay attention. Mainstream media has also been kind of distracted for a while. So it, it may seem affronting or even confrontational or made up or constructed to catch the eyes and ears of, of the media just to make kind of a splash. I think looking a little bit more closely at some sources whose purpose is to help us understand things that we might not have come into contact with before is pretty useful. All of that said, I have some audio to play for you from listeners, and then we're going to get into the chapters today. We have three chapters. They're not all very long. They are hugely important and very difficult and you are going to see why all of this does, in fact, tie together. I hope you've trusted me this far. First, we have a voicemail from Jana Lee, and she, she's referring to a premium book from before, Room with a View. I have, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, gone into the back catalog at Libsyn, and I have re-released all of the premium audiobooks. I can't make them free, but I have made them all available so that people have more to listen to. If you haven't used the app before, go to craftlit.libsyn.com, L-I-B-S-Y-N, libsyn.com slash premium, and you sign up there. Once you've signed up there, you can put the app on your phone, on your tablet. We've got it in all different varieties, iOS, Android, and Windows phones. Put the app on, sign in on the app from settings, I think, and that will unlock all of the premium episodes. For lots of complicated Apple reasons, they can't allow you to sign up for the premium feed from within the app. That's why you have to go through a browser to craftlit.libsyn.com slash premium. And then you'll have access to, what is it, 10 years worth? When did we do Wuthering Heights? It's 2011, wasn't it? Holy crud. It's nine years worth of premium audiobooks, which includes Bleak House, which could take you a very long time to listen to. All right, so here we go. Janalee's comments. Take it away, Janalee. Hi, Heather. This is Janalee. Um, this is Hikes on Valley. I am really enjoying the tenant of Wild South Hall. I'm I didn't realize that all of the Brontes had even written books, or if I heard it, I don't think that I had been interested at the time anyway. So I'm, I'm really, really enjoying the chance that I am having right now to, to get to know both Charlotte and her book better. And I love her, just everything that she's doing to, to explain the characters to us and to help us see and understand the nuances between the interactions and it, it's really enjoyable. But um, what I wanted to call today for was I actually am also listening to 
It's A Room with a View by Ian Forrester that you had recorded a little while ago. And I hadn't listened to it previously, or if I had it, it's just been the first chapter. I don't think I got the rest of the book. And I am really enjoying the chance that I have to listen to this book as well. I just finished uh, chapter eight of Ian Forster's Room with a View, and I, I was struck by the comparison of Lucy to a kite, um, I think for different reasons than you were, because I've flown kites, and while it's very tempting to let the string go and see what they'll do every single time we do that, whether it's accidentally or on purpose, um, the kite then loses control and crashes. Um, it doesn't, it can't fly properly as a kite is supposed to. It can't fly properly unless it has that string, um, that kind of grounds it. I, I wonder if he's expecting her to maybe crash and burn if, if someone isn't holding that string. But I also wonder if the point that Ian Forster is making is maybe not that someone else should be holding Lucy's string but that she should find a way to ground herself, which I don't know if that works well with the kite metaphor, but it was just something that occurred to me. I, I know that when you fly a kite, you have to have that foundation, that person that's guiding it in order for it to to um, swoop through the air and to do all of the aerial, like the tricks and stuff that you want it to do. And so I wonder, yeah, I wonder. Anyway, it's giving me a much needed sense of peace and uh, and a break, I guess, from the news and from the other things that I'm seeing and kind of being bombarded with. And it's not that I want to ignore the issues that are being discussed, um, but there is an awful lot of violence and hatred and pain, and I need a place to go that is comforting. So I really wanted to thank you for giving that to me through both through the tenant of Lazarus Hall and the discussions we're having there, as well as through Ian Forster. Um, and one thing I thought that was so interesting that has occurred to me partly because of what's, what's happening currently is that there's a form of thought policing going on in a room with a view as well. You know, nice people or uh, ladies or um, acceptable, you know, the best kind of people depending on who you're speaking to, all have these very specific, um, rigid social structures that they need to adhere to. And you see Lucy trying to break out of that because she doesn't really understand the reasoning behind it, you know, or the reasons why her, her, um, I'm, I'm only halfway through the book at this point. So Charlotte, I believe, is her cousin and is the one that keeps, you know, nudging her in certain ways. Um, but I think it comes up a little bit too because you were talking about common sense and how Certain people um, take things to be commonly understood and they're hinting and um, other people of a different culture or a different uh, social class are completely missing these hints or taking them in a completely different way because their common sense or their um, cultural experience has taught them that that means a completely different thing. And it's interesting to me that we're seeing some of those same misunderstandings play out in the news right now. and. And also, we're seeing a lot of pressure to feel or think a certain way, depending on which type of media you're um, watching or partaking of. And uh, I just think that we could all benefit from taking a step back and maybe trying to understand each other without looking for ways to be offended. So long, but again, I want to leave with a thank you for the hard work that you put into this and for the reader. Um, he's doing an amazing job, the tenant of Wildfell Hall. Um, but also the reader that did uh, A Room With A View and really enjoying her voice and, and the expressions that she puts into the book. So thank you for both of those and thank you for offering Craftlet as a as kind of a break from from the difficult reality that I'm living in right now. Um, thanks and goodbye. I love that interpretation of the kite and the grounding and I'm totally flabbergasted that I didn't go there myself, Janely, because that's the cognitive anchoring image that I had on the website. And it seems seems like such a no-brainer in retrospect. I don't know what I was thinking or not thinking at the time, but I'm so glad you listened to it. 
I'm so glad you're enjoying Room with a View. It's such a beautiful book. And I'm so glad you called in with that and, and everything else. This week, uh, your, your timing couldn't be better. This week is the last week we hear from Gilbert for a while. And then we switch to Maya Daguerre, who will be our Helen Graham. She read for us several times before. You know and love her voice. And, uh, and you're going to get more of it starting next week. But from this point on in the book, uh, this is the last week where we're really just dealing with Gilbert's neighborhood. And we have another voicemail to play for you that relates directly to this. And I, I do have a, a response. This comes from Trisha. Hi, this is Trisha from Massachusetts, and I've been trying to figure out why some books that have a lot of characters, it's really easy to keep track of all of them. Um, an example that came to mind was Anna Green Gables. There's quite a few young people and parents, and I've never had a problem keeping track of them. But then this book, Tenant, and the one just before it, I don't know why mine has gone blank, Treasure Island, in both of them, I've found that there are maybe three characters that I'm clear of who they are all the time, and then the rest, I just can't keep straight. And I'm trying to figure out, yeah, why? What is different? Um, anyone has any ideas? I'd love to hear them. Thanks. Bye. So, Tricia, I have no mathematical explanation for what you are describing. I suffer from it, too. And I know that for me, anytime people's names, anytime there are too many names with the same starting letter, like Russian novels, I get completely and horribly and hideously lost. I think in this, some of the issue is we got introduced to a lot of people very quickly, and none of their personalities were really clearly defined. In fact, we probably got more today about the Wilsons we will get more about the Wilsons. And last week we got more about Millward and his family than we had prior to this. So they all kind of blurred. I do have the PDF that I created that shows the uh, different homes, who's in the different homes. And and then the last page of the PDF is how they all interact, who's who's hooking up with who, <laughs> that kind of thing. That will be expanded upon for next week, because next week you get hit with a whole mess load of new people. And unfortunately, so I'm warning everybody in advance, you're going to need the PDF, because Anne and Emily both have a thing about the letter H. I don't know why. Heathcliff, Hereford, oh my gosh, everybody in Wuthering Heights, their name started with an H, all of the guys. Same bloody thing is going to happen to us starting next week. There's a whole lot of H guys. I will do everything I can to help you with that, including giving you a cheat sheet. So next week, there will be an expanded and updated cheat sheet for you. But Justin and I are hoping that you will be able to access this PDF from within the app as well. But if not, you will at least be able to get it from the, the Craftlet show notes at craftlet.com. This week, it's 524. Next week would be craftlet.com slash 525. I am sure someone listening has read some kind of psychological study on why we have trouble with names of characters like this. That was my best explanation. I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. 206-350-1642. You can call and leave a voicemail and let us know your thoughts and share your wisdom with us on anything that we've talked about today. And to that effect, last week, right after the episode was released, and thank you, Maureen, for getting back to me so quickly. Uh, Maureen wrote in and shared a comment, which I thought was very important. I put it on the show notes for last week, and I am reading it to you right now as well. She wrote in, and this is about Octavia Butler, who is uh, African-American and a science fiction writer. She said, in the current climate, I think it's worth noting that Octavia Butler is probably not one of the few women of color writing science fiction, but rather one of the few women of color being published in science fiction. Systemic racism shows up everywhere. And holy smoke, I just about choked when I read that and thought, duh, yes, absolutely. 
And then Maureen went on to say, the most recent This American Life podcast covered Afrofuturism, and it was a rebroadcast, so they're going through their archives and pulling stuff up that is relevant to the time as well. She said, so I would imagine that a lot of people of color are writing science fiction, but the publishing world may not be publishing them. And of course, it's hard for anyone to get published, so it just compounds the problem. So thank you, Maureen. Yes, absolutely. I can't believe I was such a dope. I mean, I can. I have certainly been a dope before. But thank you for writing in and sharing that. I really appreciated it. Okay, I don't have anything to give you before we listen to Gilbert's chapters today. All I can say is don't give up on him. Remember, remember, Gilbert is writing to us from his future self. And the one thing we know about him so far is that he has been a trustworthy narrator, unafraid of exposing his weaknesses to his friend, which means also unafraid of exposing his weaknesses to us. Anne Bronte has done all of this very specifically and for specific reasons. Trust her, and it's going to be tricky. I'll catch you on the flip side, and we'll talk then. Today you have chapters 13, 14, and 15 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, read for us by Eden Ballantyne. Here we go. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, Chapter 13, A Return to Duty. My dear Gilbert, I wish you would try to be a bit more amiable, said my mother one morning, after some display of unjustifiable ill humour on my part. You say there is nothing the matter with you, and nothing has happened to grieve you, and yet I never saw anyone so altered as you within these last few days. You haven't a good word to say for anybody, friends and strangers, equals and inferiors, it's all the same. I do wish you'd try and check it. Check what? Why your strange temper? You don't know how it spoils you. I'm sure a finer disposition than yours by nature could not be, if you'd let it have fair play, so you've no excuse that way. While she thus remonstrated, I took up a book, and laying it open on the table before me, pretended to be deeply absorbed in its perusal, for I was equally unable to justify myself, and unwilling to acknowledge my errors, and I wished to have nothing to say on the matter. But my excellent parent went on lecturing, and then came to coaxing, and began to stroke my hair. I was getting to feel like quite a good boy, but my mischievous brother, who was idling about the room, revived my corruption by suddenly calling out, Don't touch him, mother. He'll bite. He's a very tiger of human form. I've given him up for my part. Fairly disowned him, cast him off, root and branch. It's as much as my life is worth to come within six yards of him. The other day he nearly fractured my skull for singing a pretty and offensive love song on purpose to amuse him. Oh, Gilbert, how could you? exclaimed my mother. I told you to hold off your noise first, you know, Fergus, said I. Yes, but when I assured you it was no trouble, I went on to the next verse, thinking you might like it better. You clutched me by the shoulders and dashed me away, right against the wall there, with such force that I thought I had bitten my tongue in two and expected to see the place plastered with my brains. And when I put my hand to my head and found my skull not broken, I thought it was a miracle and no mistake. But poor fellow, added he, with a sentimental sigh, his heart's broken, that's the truth of it, and his head's. Will you be silent now? cried I, starting up, and eyeing the fellow so fiercely that my mother, thinking I meant to inflict some grievous bodily injury, lay her hand on my arm and besought me to let him alone, and he walked leisurely out, with his hands in his pockets, singing provokingly, Shall I, because a woman's fair, etc. I'm not going to defile my fingers with him, said I, in answer to the maternal intercession. I wouldn't touch him with the tongs. I now recollected that I had business with Robert Wilson, concerning the purchase of a certain field adjoining my farm, a business I had been putting off from day to day, for I had no interest in anything now. And besides, I was misanthropically inclined, and moreover, had a particular objection to meeting Jane Wilson, or her mother. For though I had too good reason now to credit their reports concerning Mrs Graham, I did not like them a bit the better for it. 
or Eliza Millward either, and the thought of meeting them was the more repugnant to me that I could not now defy their seeming calumnies and triumph in my own convictions as before. But today I determined to make an effort to return to my duty. Though I found no pleasure in it, it will be less irksome than idleness. At all events, it will be more profitable. If life promised no enjoyment within my vocation, at least it offered no allurements out of it. And henceforth, I would put my shoulder to the wheel and toil away, like any poor drudge of a cart horse that was fairly broken in its labour, and plod through life not wholly useless if not agreeable, and uncomplaining if not contented with my lot. Thus, resolving with a kind of sullen resignation, if such a term may be allowed, I wended my way to Rycourt Farm, scarcely expecting to find its owner within at this time of day, but hoping to learn in what part of the premises he was most likely to be found. Absent he was, but expected home in a few minutes, and I was desired to step into the parlour and wait. Mrs Wilson was busy in the kitchen, but the room was not empty, and I scarcely checked an involuntary recoil as I entered it, for there sat Miss Wilson, chatting with Eliza Millward. However, I determined to be cool and civil. Eliza seemed to have made the same resolution on her part. We had not met since the evening of the tea party, but there was no visible emotion either of pleasure or pain. No attempt at pathos. No display of injured pride. She was cool in temper, civil in demeanour. There was even an ease and cheerfulness about her air and manner that I made no pretensions to, but there was a depth of malice in her too expressive eye that plainly told me that I was not forgiven. For though she no longer hoped to win me to herself, she still hated her rival, and evidently delighted to wreak her spite on me. Now, on the other hand, Miss Wilson was as affable and courteous as heart could wish, and though I was in no very conversable humour myself, the two ladies between them managed to keep up a pretty continuous fire of small talk. But Eliza took advantage of the first convenient pause to ask if I had lately seen Mrs Graham, in a tone of mere casual inquiry, but with a sidelong glance, intended to be playful, mischievous, really brimful and running over with malice. Not lately, I replied in a careless tone, but sternly repelling her odious glances with my eyes for I was vexed to feel the colour mounting to my forehead, despite my strenuous efforts to appear unmoved. What? Are you beginning to tire already? I thought so noble a creature would have power to attach you for a year at least. I would rather not speak of her now. Ah, then you are convinced at last of your mistake. You have at length discovered that your divinity is not quite the immaculate. I desire not to speak of her, Miss Eliza. Oh, I beg your pardon. I perceive Cupid's arrows have been too sharp for you. The wounds be more than skin deep are not yet healed, and bleed afresh at every mention of the loved one's name. Say rather, interposed Miss Wilson, that Mr Markham feels the name is unworthy to be mentioned in the presence of right-minded females. I wonder, Eliza, you should think of referring to that unfortunate person. You might know the mention of a name would be anything but agreeable to anyone here present. How could this be born? I rose and was about to clap my hat upon my head and burst away in wrathful indignation from the house, but recollecting just in time to save my dignity, the folly of such a proceeding, and how it would give my fair tormentor a merry laugh at my expense for the sake of what I acknowledged in my own heart to be unworthy of the slightest sacrifice, though the ghost of my former reverence and love so hung about me still, that I could not bear to hear her name aspersed by others. I merely walked to the window, and having spent a few seconds in vengeably biting my lip, and sternly repressing the passionate heaving in my chest, I observed to Miss Wilson that I could see nothing of her brother, and added that, as my time was precious, it would perhaps be better to call again tomorrow at some time when I should be sure to find him at home. Oh, no, said she. If you wait a minute, he'll be sure to come, for he has business at Lawton. That was our market town. And will require a little refreshment before he goes. I submitted accordingly, with the best grace I could, and happily I had not long to wait. 
Mr Wilson soon arrived, and, indisposed for business as I was at that moment, and little as I cared for the field or its owner, I forced my attention to the matter in hand, with the very credible determination, and quickly concluded the bargain, perhaps more to the thrifty farmer's satisfaction than he cared to acknowledge. Then, leaving him to the discussion of his substantial refreshment, I gladly quitted the house and went to look after my reapers. Leaving them busy on the side of the valley, I ascended the hill, intending to visit the cornfield in the more elevated regions and see when it would be right for the sickle. But I did not visit it that day, for as I approached I beheld at no great distance Mrs Graham and her son coming down in the opposite direction. They saw me, and Arthur was already running to meet me, but I immediately turned back and walked steadily homewards, for I had fully determined never to encounter his mother again regardless of the shrill voice in my ear calling upon me to wait a moment. I pursued the even tenor of my way, and he soon relinquished the pursuit as hopeless, always called away by his mother. At all events, when I looked back five minutes after, not a trace of either was to be seen. This incident agitated and disturbed me most unaccountably, unless you would account for it by saying that Cupid's arrows not only have been too sharp for me, but they were barbed and deeply rooted and I had not yet been able to wrench them from my heart. However that be, I was rendered doubly miserable for the remainder of the day. Chapter 14. An Assault Next morning, I bethought me I too had business at Lawton, so I mounted my horse and set forth on the expedition soon after breakfast. It was a dull, drizzly day, but that was no matter. It was all the more suitable for my frame of mind. It was likely to be a lonely journey, for it was no market day, and the road I traversed was little frequented at any other time, but that suited me all the better too. As I trotted along, however, chewing the cud of bitter fancies, I heard another horse at no great distance behind me, but I never conjectured who the rider might be, or troubled my head about him, till on slackening my pace to ascend a gentle acclivity, or rather suffering my horse to slacken his pace into a leisurely walk. For wrapped in my own reflections, I was letting it jog on as leisurely as it thought proper. I lost ground, and my fellow traveller overtook me. He accosted me by name, for it was no stranger. It was Mr. Lawrence. Instinctively, the fingers of my whip hand tingled and grasped their charge with a convulsive energy, but I restrained the impulse, and answering his salutation with a nod, attempted to push on. But he pushed on beside me, and began to talk about the weather and the crops, I gave the briefest possible answers to his queries and observations and fell back. He fell back too, and asked if my horse was lame. I replied with a look, at which he placidly smiled. I was as much astonished as exasperated at this singular pertinacity and imperturbable assurance on his part. I had thought the circumstances of our last meeting would have left such an impression on his mind as to render him cold and distant ever after. Instead of that... He appeared not only to have forgotten all former offences, but to be impenetrable to all present incivilities. Formerly, the slightest hint or mere fancied coldness in tone or glance had sufficed to repulse him. Now, positive rudeness could not drive him away. Had he heard of all my disappointment, and was come to witness the result, and triumph in my despair, I grasped my whip with more determined energy than before, but still forbore to raise it, and rode on in silence waiting for some more tangible cause of offence, before I opened the floodgates of my soul and poured out the damned-up fury that was forming and swelling within. Markham, said he, in his usual quiet tone, why do you quarrel with your friends? Because you have been disappointed in one quarter. You have found your hopes defeated, but how am I to blame for it? I warned you beforehand, you know, but you would not. He said no more, for impelled by a fiend at my elbow, I had seized my whip by the small end, and swift and sudden as a flash of lightning brought the other end down upon his head. It was not without a feeling of savage satisfaction that I beheld the instant, deadly pallor that overspread his face, and the few red drops that trickled down his forehead while he reeled a moment in his saddle, and then fell backwards to the ground. The pony, surprised to be so strangely relieved of its burden, started and capered and kicked a little, and then made use of its freedom to go and crop the grass of the hedge-bank, while its master lay as still and silent as a corpse. Had I killed him? An icy hand seemed to grasp my heart and check its pulsation. 
As I bent over him, gazing with breathless intensity upon their ghastly upturned face. But no. He moved his eyelid and uttered a slight groan. I breathed again. He was only stunned by the fall. It served him right. It would teach him better manners in future. Should I help him to his horse? No. For any other combination of offence I would. But his was too unpardonable. He might mount it himself, if he liked. In a while. Already he was beginning to stir and look about him. And there it was for him. Quietly browsing on the roadside. So with a muttered execration, I left the fellow to his fate and clapping spurs to my own horse, galloped away, excited by a combination of feelings it would not be easy to analyse. And perhaps, if I did so, the result would not be very credible to my disposition. For I'm not sure that a species of exultation in what I had done was not one principal concomitant. Shortly, however, the effervescence began to abate, and not many minutes elapsed before I had turned and gone back to look after the fate of my victim. It was no generous impulse, no kind relentings that led me to this, nor even the fear of what might be the consequences to myself if I had finished my assault upon the squire by leaving him thus neglected and exposed to further injury. It was, simply, the voice of conscience, and I took great credit to myself for attending so promptly to its dictates and judging the merit of the deed by sacrifice it cost. I was not far wrong. Mr Lawrence and his pony had both altered their positions in some degree. The pony had wandered eight or ten yards further away, and he had managed somehow to remove himself from the middle of the road. I found him seated near a cumbent position on the bank, looking very white and sickly still, and holding his cambric handkerchief, now more red than white, to his head. It must have been a powerful blow, but half the credit, or the blame of it, which you please, must be attributed to the whip which was garnished with the massive horse's head of plated metal. The grass being sodden with rain afforded the young gentleman a rather inhospitable couch. His claws were considerably bemired, and his hat was rolling in the mud on the other side of the road. But his thoughts seemed chiefly bent upon his pony, on which he was wistfully gazing, half in helpless anxiety, and half in hopeless abandonment to his fate. I dismounted, however, and having fastened my own animal to the nearest tree, first picked up his hat, intending to clasp it on his head, but either he considered his head unfit for a hat, or the hat, in its present condition unfit for his head, for shrinking away the one, he took the other from my hand, and scornfully cast it aside. "'It's good enough for you,' I muttered. My next office was to catch his pony and bring it to him, which was soon accomplished for the beast was quiet enough in the main, and only winced and flirted a trifle till I got hold of the bridle. But then, I must see him in the saddle. Here, you fellow scoundrel dog, give me your hand, and I'll help you to mount. No. He turned from me in disgust. I attempted to take him by the arm. He shrank away, as if there had been contamination in my touch. What? You won't? Well, you may sit there till doomsday for what I care. But I suppose you don't want to lose all that blood in your body. I'll just condense to bind that up for you. Let me alone, if you please. Hm! With all my heart. You may go to the devil if you choose, and say I sent you! But before I abandoned him to his fate, I flung his pony's bridle over a stake in the hedge, and threw him my handkerchief, as his own was now saturated with blood. He took it, and cast it back at me in abhorrence and contempt, with all the strength he could muster. It wanted but this to fill the measure of his offences. With exorations not loud but deep, I left him to live or die as he could, well satisfied that I had done my duty in attempting to save him, but forgetting how I had erred in bringing him into such a condition, and how insultingly my after-services had been offered and sullenly prepared to meet the consequences if he should choose to say I had attempted to murder him, which I thought not unlikely as it seemed probably was actuated by such spiteful motives in so perseveringly refusing my assistant. Having remounted my horse, I just looked back to see how he was getting on, before I rode away. He had risen from the ground, and grasping his pony's mane was attempting to resume his seat in the saddle, but scarcely had he put his foot in the stirrup, 
when a sickness or dizziness seemed to overpower him. He leant forward a moment, with his head drooped on the animal's back, and they made one more effort, which proving ineffectual, he sank back on the bank where I had left him, reposing his head on the oozing turf, and to all appearance as he calmly reclined as if he had been taking his rest on his sofa at home. I ought to have helped him in spite of myself. To have bound up the wound he was unable to staunch, and insisted upon getting him on his horse and seeing him safe home. But besides my bitter indignation against himself, there was the question what to say to his servants, and what to my own family. Either I should have to acknowledge the deed, which would set me down as a madman, unless I acknowledged the motive too, and that seemed impossible. Or I must get up a lie, which seemed equally out of the question, especially as Mr Lawrence will probably reveal the whole truth, and thereby bring it to tenfold disgrace, unless I were villain enough, presuming on the absence of witnesses, to persist in my own version of the case, and make him out a still greater scoundrel than he was. No, he had only received a cut above the temple, and perhaps a few bruises from the fall, or the hoofs of his own pony. That could not kill him if he lay there half a day, and if he could not help himself, surely someone would be coming by. It would be impossible that a whole day should pass and no one should traverse the road but ourselves. As for what he might choose to say hereafter, I would take my chance about it. If he told lies, I would contradict him. If he told the truth, I would bear it as best I could. I was not obliged to enter into explanation further than I thought proper. Perhaps he might choose to be silent on the subject, for fearing of raising inquiry as to the cause of the quarrel and drawing the public attention to his connection with Mrs Graham, which, whether for her sake or his own, he seemed so very desirous to conceal. Thus reasoning, I trotted away to the town, where I duly transacted my business, and performed various little commissions for my mother and Rose, with a very laudable exactitude, considering the different circumstances of the case. In returning home, I was troubled with the sundry misgivings about the unfortunate Lawrence. The question, what if I should find him still lying on the damp earth, fairly dying of cold and exhaustion, already stark and chill, thrust itself most unpleasantly upon my mind, and the appalling possibility pictured itself with a painful vividness to my imagination as I approached the spot where I had left him. But no, thank heaven. Both man and horse were gone, and nothing was left to witness against me but two objects, unpleasant enough in themselves to be sure, and presenting a very ugly, not to say murderous, appearance. In one place, the hat, saturated with rain and coated with mud, indented and broken above the brim by that villainous whip-handle. In another, the crimson handkerchief, soaking in a deeply tinctured pool of water, for much rain had fallen in the interim, Bad news flies fast. It was hardly four o'clock when I got home. But my mother gravely accosted me with, Oh, Gilbert, such an accident. Rose has been shopping in the village and she's heard that Mr Lawrence has been thrown from his horse and brought home dying. This shot me a trifle, as you may suppose. But I was comforted to hear that he had frightfully fractured his skull and broken his leg. For, assured of the falsehood of this, I trusted the rest of the story was equally exaggerated, and when I heard my mother and sister so feelingly deploring his condition, I had considerable difficulty in preventing myself from telling them the real extent of his injuries, as far as I knew them. You must go and see him tomorrow, said my mother. Or oh, today, suggested Rose. There's plenty of time, and you can have the pony as your horse is tired, won't you, Gilbert, as soon as you've had something to eat? No, no, how can we tell that it isn't all a false report? It's highly am... Oh, I'm sure it isn't, for the village is all alive about it, and I saw two people that had seen others that had seen the man that found him. That sounds far-fetched, but it isn't so when you think of it. Oh, but Lawrence is a good rider. It's not likely it would fall from his horse at all, and if he did, it is highly improbable he would break his bones in that way. It must be a gross exaggeration at least. No, but the horse kicked him or something. What, his quiet little pony? How do you know it was that? He seldom rides any other. At any rate, said my mother, you will call tomorrow. 
whether it be true or false, exaggerated or otherwise, we shall like to know how he is. Fergus may go. Why not you? He has more time. I'm busy just now. Oh, but Gilbert, how can you be so composed about this? You won't mind business for an hour or two in case of this sort when your friend is at the point of death. He is not, I tell you. For anything you know, he may well be. You can't tell till you've seen him. At all events, he must have met some terrible accident and you ought to see him. He'll take it very unkind if you don't. Confound it, I can't. He and I have not been on good terms of late. Oh, my dear boy, surely, surely you are not so unforgiving as to carry your little differences to such a length as... Little differences indeed, I muttered. Well, but only remember the occasion. Think how... Well, well, don't bother me now. I'll see about it, I replied. And my seeing about it was to send Fergus the next morning, with my mother's compliments, to make the requisite inquiries. For, of course, my going was out of the question, or sending a message either. He brought back intelligence that the young squire was laid up with the complicated evils of a broken head and certain contusions, occasioned by a fall, of which he did not trouble himself to relate the particulars and the subsequent misconduct of his horse, and a severe cold, the consequences of lying on the wet ground in the rain. But there were no broken bones and no immediate prospects of dissolution. It was evident, then, that for Mrs Graham's sake, it was not his intention to criminate me. Chapter 15. An Encounter and Its Consequences That day was rainy, like its predecessor, but towards the evening it began to clear up a little, and the next morning was fair and promising. I was out on the hill with the reapers. A light wind swept over the corn, and all nature laughed in the sunshine. The lark was rejoicing among the silvery floating clouds. The late rain had so sweetly freshened and cleared the air, and washed the sky, and left such glittering gems on branch and blade, that not even the farmer could have the heart to blame it. But no ray of sunshine could reach my heart. No breeze could freshen it. Nothing could fill the void my faith and hope and joy in Helen Graham had left or drive away the keen regrets and bitter dregs of lingering love that still oppressed it. While I stood with folded arms, abstractly gazing on the undulating swell of the corn, not yet disturbed by the reapers, something gentle pulled my skirts, and a small voice, no longer welcome to my ears, aroused me with the startling words, Mr Markham, Mamma wants you. Wants me, Arthur? Yes, why do you look so queer? said he, half laughing, half frightened, at the unexpected aspect of my face, in suddenly turning towards him. And why have you kept away so long? Come, won't you come? I'm busy now, I replied, scarcely knowing what to answer. He looked up in his childish bewilderment, but before I could speak again, the lady herself was at my side. Gilbert, I must speak with you, said she, in a tone of suppressed vehemence, I looked at her pale cheek and glittering eye, but answered nothing. Only for a moment, pleaded she. Just step aside into this other field. She glanced at the reapers, some of whom were directing looks of impertinent curiosity towards her. I won't keep you a minute. I accompanied her through the gap. Arthur, darling, run and gather those bluebells, said she, pointing to some that were gleaming at some distance under the hedge along which we had walked. The child hesitated as if unwilling to quit my side. Go, love, repeated she more urgently, and in a tone which, though not unkind, demanded prompt obedience, and obtained it. Well, Mrs Graham, said I, calmly and coldly, for though I saw she was miserable and pitied her, I felt glad to have it in my power to torment her. She fixed her eye upon me with a look that pierced me to the heart, and yet it made me smile. I don't ask the reason of this change, Gilbert, said she, with bitter calmness. I know it too well, but though I could see myself suspected and content by every one else, and bear it with calmness, I cannot endure it from you. Why did you not come to hear my explanation on the day I appointed to give it? 
because I happened, in the interim, to learn all you would have told me, and a trifle more, I imagine. Impossible, for I would have told you all, cried she, passionately. But I won't now, for I see you are not worthy of it. And her pale lips quivered with agitation. Why not, may I ask? She repelled my mocking smile with a glance of scornful indignation. Because you never understood me, or you would not have listened to my traducers. My confidence would be misplaced in you. You are not the man I thought you. Go. I won't care what you think of me. She turned away, and I went. For I thought that would torment her as much as anything. And I believe I was right. For, looking back a minute after, I saw her turning half round as if hoping or expecting to find me still beside her, and then she stood still, and cast one look behind. It was a look less expressive of anger than of bitter anguish and despair, but I immediately assumed an aspect of indifference, and affected to be gazing carelessly around me, and I suppose she went on, for after lingering a while to see if she would come back or call, I ventured one more glance, and saw her a good way off, moving rapidly up the field with little Arthur running by her side and apparently talking as he went, but she kept her face averted from him, as if to hide some uncontrollable emotion, and I returned to my business. But I soon began to regret my precipitancy in leaving her so soon. It was evident she loved me. Probably she was tired of Mr Lawrence and wished to exchange him for me, and if I had loved and reverenced her less to begin with, the preference might have been gratified and amused me, but now the contrast between her outward seeming and her inward mind, as I suppose between my former and my present opinion of her, was so harrowing, so distressing to my feelings, that it swallowed up every lighter consideration. But still, I was curious to know what sort of explanation she would have given me, or would give now, if I pressed her for it. How much she would confess, and how she would endeavour to excuse herself. I longed to know what to despise, and what to admire in her, how much to pity and how much to hate, and, what was more, I would know. I would see her once more, and fairly satisfy myself in what light to regard her, before we parted. Lost to me she was, forever, of course. But still, but still I could not bear to think that we had parted, for the last time, with so much unkindness and misery on both sides. That last look of hers had sunk into my heart. I could not forget it. What a fool I was. Had she not deceived me, injured me, blighted my happiness for life? Well, I'll see her, however, was my concluding resolve. But not today. Today and tonight she may think upon her sins, and be as miserable as she will. Tomorrow I will see her once again, and know something more about her. The interview may be serviceable to her, or it may not. At any rate, it will give a breath of excitement to the life she has doomed to stagnation, and may calm with certainty some agitating thoughts. I did go on the morrow, but not till towards the evening, after the business of the day was concluded, that is, between six and seven, and the westening sun was gleaming redly on the old hall, and flaming in the lattice windows as I reached it, imparting to the place a cheerfulness not its own. I need not distill upon the feelings with which I approached the shrine of my former divinity, that spot teeming with a thousand delightful recollections and glorious dreams, all darkened now by one disastrous truth. Rachel admitted me into the parlour, and went to call for her mistress, for she was not there, but there was a desk left open, on the little round table beside the high-backed chair, with a book laid upon it, Her limited but choice collection of books was almost as familiar to me as my own. But this volume I had not seen before. I took it up. It was Sir Humphrey Davies's last days of a philosopher, and on the first leaf was written, Frederick Lawrence. I closed the book, but kept it in my hand, and stood facing the door with my back to the fireplace, calmly waiting her arrival, for I did not doubt she would come and soon I heard her steps in the hall. My heart was beginning to throb, but I checked it with an internal rebuke, and maintained my composure, outwardly at least. She entered, calm, pale, collected. 
To what am I indebted for this favour, Mr. Markham? Said she, with such a severe but quiet dignity, as almost disconcerted me. But I answered with a smile, and impudently enough, Well, I'm come to hear your explanation. I told you I would not give it, said she. I said you were unworthy of my confidence. Oh, very well, replied I, moving to the door. Stay a moment, said she. This is the last time I shall see you. Don't go just yet. I remained, awaiting her further command. Tell me, resumed she, on what grounds you believe these things against me? Who told you? What did they say? I paused a moment. She met my eye as unflinchingly as if her bosom had been steeled with conscious innocence. She was resolved to know the worst, and determined to dare it too. I can crush that bold spirit, thought I. But while I secretly exulted in my power, I felt disposed to dally with my victim like a cat, showing her the book that I still held in my hand, and pointing to the name on the flyleaf, but fixing my eye upon her face, I asked, Do you know that gentleman? Of course I do, replied she, and a sudden flush suffused her features. Whether of shame or anger, I could not tell. It rather resembled the latter. What next, sir? How long since you saw him? Who gave you the right to catechise me on this or any subject? Oh, no one. It is quite your option whether to answer or not. And now, let me ask you, have you heard what has lately befallen this friend of yours? Because if you have not... I will not be insulted, Mr. Markham, cried she, almost infuriated at my manner. So you had better leave this house at once, if you came only for that. I did not come to insult you. I came to hear your explanation. And I tell you, I won't give it, retorted she, pacing the room in a state of strong excitement, with her hands clasped tightly together, breathing short and flashing fires of indignation from her eyes. I will not concede to explain myself to one that can make a jest of such horrible suspicions and be so easily led to entertain them. I do not make a jest of them, Mrs Graham, returned I, dropping at once my tone of taunting sarcasm. I heartily wish I could find them a jesting matter. And as to being easily led to suspect, God knows what a blind, incredulous fool I have hitherto been, perversively shutting my eyes and stopping my ears against everything that threatened to shake my confidence in you till proof itself confounded my infatuation. What proof, sir? Well, I'll tell you. You remember that evening when I was here last? I do. Even then you dropped some hints that might have opened the eyes of a wiser man. But they had no such effect upon me. I went on trusting and believing, hoping against hope and adoring where I should not comprehend. It so happened, however, that after I left you, I turned back, drawn by pure depth of sympathy and ardour of affection, not daring to intrude my presence openly upon you, but unable to resist the temptation of catching one glimpse through the window, just to see how you were, for I had left you apparently in great affliction, and I parted blaming my own want of forbearance and discretion as the cause of it. If I did wrong, love alone was my incentive, and the punishment was severe enough, for it was just as I had reached the tree, that you came into the garden with your friend. Not choosing to show myself under the circumstances, I stood still in the shadows till you both passed by. And how much of our conversation did you hear? I heard quite enough, Helen. And it was well for me that I did hear it, for nothing less could have cured my infatuation. I always said and thought that I would never believe a word against you unless I heard it from your own lips. All the hints and affirmations of others are treated as malignant, baseless slander. Your own self-accusations are believed to be overstrained. And all that seemed unaccountable in your position are trusted that you could account for if you chose. Mrs Graham had discontinued her walk. She leant against one end of the chimney piece, opposite that which near I was standing, with her chin resting on her closed hand, her eyes no longer burning with anger, but gleaming with restless excitement, sometimes glancing at me while I spoke then coursing the opposite wall, or fixed upon the carpet. "'You should have come to me after all,' said she, "'and heard what I had to say in my own justification. "'It was ungenerous, and wrong to withdraw yourself so secretly, 
and suddenly, immediately after such an ardent protestation of attachment, without ever assigning a reason for the change, you would have told me all, no matter how bitterly, it would have been better than this silence. To what end should I have done so? You could not have enlightened me further on the subject which alone concerned me, nor could you have made me discredit the evidence of my senses. I desire our intimacy to be discontinued at once, as you yourself had acknowledged would probably be the case if I knew all, but I did not wish to unbraid you, though, as you also acknowledged, you had deeply wronged me. Yes, you had done me an injury you can never repair, or any other either. You have blighted the freshness and promise of youth, and made my life a wilderness. I might live a hundred years, but I could never recover from the effects of this withering blow, and never forget it hereafter. You smile, Mrs. Graham said I, suddenly stopping short, checked in my passionate declamation by an unutterable feeling to behold her actually smiling at the picture of the ruin she had wrought. Did I? replied she, looking seriously up. I was not aware of it. If I did, it was not for pleasure at the thought of the harm I had done you. Heaven knows I have had torment enough at the bare possibility of that. It was for joy to find that you had some depth of soul and feeling after all, and a hope that I had not been utterly mistaken in your worth, but smiles and tears are so alike with me, they are neither of them confined to any particular feelings. I often cry when I am happy, and smile when I am sad. She looked at me again, and seemed to expect a reply, but I continued silent. Would you be very glad, resumed she, to find that you were mistaken in your conclusion? How can you ask it, Helen? I don't say I can clear myself altogether, said she, speaking low and fast, while her heart beated visibly in her bosom, heaving with excitement. But would you be glad to discover I was better than you think me? Anything that could in the least degree tend to restore my former opinion of you, to excuse the regard I still feel for you, and alleviate the pangs of unutterable regret that accompany it, will be only too gladly, too eagerly received. Her cheeks burned, and her whole frame trembled now, with excessive agitation. She did not speak, but flew to her desk, and snatching thence what seemed a thick album or manuscript volume, hastily tore away a few leaves from the end, and thrust the rest into my hand, saying, You needn't read it all, but take it home with you, and hurried from the room. But when I had left the house, and was proceeding down the walk, she opened the window and called me back. It was only to say, Bring it back when you have read it, and don't breathe a word of what it tells you to any living being. I trust your honour. Before I could answer, she had closed the casement and turned away. I saw her cast herself back in the old oak chair and cover her face with her hands. Her feelings had been wrought to a pitch that rendered it necessary to seek relief in tears. Panting with eagerness and struggling to suppress my hopes, I hurried home and rushed upstairs to my room, having first provided myself with a candle though it was scarcely twilight yet, then shutting and bolting the door, determined to tolerate no interruptions, and sitting down before the table, opening out my prize, and delivering myself up to its perusal, first hastily turning over the leaves and snatching a sentence here and there, and then setting myself steadily to read it through. I have it now before me, and though you could not, of course, peruse it with half the interest that I did, I know you would not be satisfied with an abbreviation of its contents, and you shall have the whole, save perhaps a few passages here and there of mere temporary interest to the writer, or such as would serve to encumber the story rather than elucidate it. It begins somewhat abruptly thus, but we will reserve its commencement for another chapter. It begins somewhat abruptly, thus, but we will reserve its commencement for another chapter, and call it Chapter 16, The Warnings of experience. And that is where Mia Daguerre will pick up next week. Gilbert. Oh, Gilbert. It would be easy to say he's young and foolish and heartbroken and angry and therefore acted the idiot. We have a lot more male listeners now than we used to. And so I invite you men to call in. 1-206-350-1642 1-206-350-1642 or write to me heather at craftlit.com and let me know if I can share what you write with or without your name 
and let us know how you feel about these chapters. Anne Bronte was doing two very specific things from what I have learned in my research. One, she had seen some pretty heinous behavior when she was outside of her own home and off in the world as a governess. I am not entirely positive that she ever saw anything exactly like what Gilbert did to Mr. Lawrence. It wouldn't surprise me a whole lot if she'd seen something along those lines, or at least saw the repercussions of something along those lines. Gilbert, as far as we can tell, does not drink, so that is not uh, an easy answer or lame excuse for his behavior. Certainly, I have known people in my life who are lovely, kind, quiet, calm, polite, gentle people who have been pushed to a point where they have snapped and, and actually don't remember doing anything harmful or violent or aggressive, and yet they did. This doesn't seem like one of those things, since Lawrence wasn't actually trying to antagonize him. It wasn't like Lawrence was being a bully. Certainly, Gilbert's relationship with Helen Graham has been frustrating for him. Not that that is an excuse at all, uh, but he has quite definitely worked himself up into a state over her, and then a state over her and his perception of, of Mr. Lawrence. Helen doesn't seem to know what's happened to Mr. Lawrence yet, fully. But as Gilbert is talking to her in the last chapter, the description of her reaction I thought was fascinating. The section uh, a little bit before the end of the chapter, the last chapter, Mrs. Graham had discontinued her walk. She leaned against one end of the chimney piece opposite that near which I was standing, with her chin resting on her closed hand, her eyes no longer burning with anger, but gleaming with restless excitement, sometimes glancing at me while I spoke, then coursing the opposite wall or fixed upon the carpet. Something is going on. We are going to learn more about what's going on next week, I promise. Gilbert's outpouring of frustration and hurt, uh, pain, initially met by Helen with some amount of frustration of her own because she has tried to make it clear to him that for whatever reason, she's not really available to be anything but his friend. As soon as she hears what set him off, this is her response. No longer anger, but glittering-eyed excitement. She's got something to say. We are going to find out what that something is. I said that Anne Bronte had two reasons for doing what she did in this chapter. One, I believe she saw some pretty bad behavior in her time as a governess. Two, she and her brother and sisters had all been steeped in Byron and the magazines that their family took, which but they weren't penny dreadfuls. They weren't, you know, rags. <laughs> they were better than average writing, but they were still a fictional version of a checkout stand tabloid. The stories were always overwrought and, well, not always, they were largely and often overwrought and gothic and romance capital R. So, you know, windswept plains and stormy skies and evil intentions and all of this stuff. So she is absolutely drawing on the Gondol stories that Gondol and Angria and Glasstown, all of these long standing stories that she and mostly Emily, but also Charlotte and Branford, they were all always inhabiting, and I mean that as a specific usage of the word, intellectually, mentally, emotionally inhabiting these other worlds, which were 100% melodrama worlds. The best and most relentless example of that is absolutely Wuthering Heights. You get this same kind of gothic overwroughtness in Jane Eyre. Rochester can be a real jerk. And for new listeners who haven't read the book yet or listened to the book yet, I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but I am going to say Rochester can be a real jerk, especially when it comes to the attic. So that was pretty good, right? So not for nothing, all of the Brontes went to this place at some point. This specific set of chapters 
is the one that launched the most vociferous criticisms against this book. There's one other section later on that garnered some of the same criticism that this bit did. But the the idea that you could have someone who was a gentleman by all exterior hints, Gilbert's clearly educated, he reads a lot, he's a gentleman farmer, they have land, he has employees, he has enough time for some some leisure pursuits as well. According to the mores at the time, there is no way someone like him could perpetrate something like this. That is beyond the pale. That is outside the realm of possibility. This is not something a gentleman could or would ever do. And what do we know from reality? We know that that's absolutely not true. People who look real nice on the outside and clean up good, (laughs) you cleaned up real good. Well done. They can absolutely do horrible, horrible things. Victorian, male Victorian book reviewers did not believe that was true. Anne had seen it for herself. So for listeners who didn't like Wuthering Heights and don't like the overwrought Gothic melodrama, I apologize for the chapter. I guarantee you Anne did it for a reason, and the reasons become more and more clear as we go on. But part of that purpose on her part was specifically to get across the fact that nice guys who clean up well can do horrible things. And it's better if you know that than if you don't. It's a way to protect young women if they know that this can happen. I'll let that sit with you, and I'm going to leave it there. We're in an interesting and complicated time. Last thing for those of you who are making masks, Amy on the chat last night shared Tom Bin of Tom Bin Bags, B-I-H-N. I've linked out to his pattern page. He and his people came up with a mask design. That is genius. You totally have to watch the video to know how to make the mask. Super, super cool. They are also selling them if you don't want to make one yourself. They look super comfortable. Everything Tom Bin makes is quality, and that includes the tutorial pages and videos that they've uh, that they shared with everybody. So super crazy helpful. Love that. The Craftlet show notes, craftlet.com slash 524. Or if you have the app installed, you just look at the show notes underneath that and everything's there. I'm putting links to the book chat notes from Tuesday and Thursday this week. So many good books. We talked about uh, good books and YouTube videos and movies and all sorts of stuff. All are linked out to from the show notes, so you can access them that way. Amy also shared a Paint by Numbers app. If you need to relax, here's a way to do it. (laughs) A Paint by Numbers app for your phone or tablet. Yes, it's called paint.ly. So it looks like Paintly. It's paint.ly. All right, I'm letting you go. It was long, I know. Thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for being awesome. Don't forget, we wear our masks to protect others. It is a sign of caring about other people. It is not to protect ourselves. I also linked out to a video that Amy recommended if you wonder or would like to see some proof that wearing masks actually does protect other people. We have that for you now. So thank you to Amy and Jennifer and Kelly and everybody else who was at our chats this last week and Toshi, who I know you're Wi-Fi comes and goes, and I'm sorry. Every time you started to say something super important, we lost you. But we knew what you were talking about and continued on until you came back. Take care of each other. Protect each other. Be well. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page 
or follow at Craftlet on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>